Hello and welcome to a special edition of Be The Gift Connections, supporting burn survivors, a webinar hosted by Sierra Donor Services to learn about the Firefighters Burn Institute and how tissue donation improves the lives of burn survivors. So just a little background, more than 300 children visit the ER and two die each day from burn injuries. Um, and today I'm excited that we'll learn more about our Firefighters Burn Institute work to serve burn survivors um, through their youth camps, social outings, awarding scholarships, and joining us is Joe Pick, the Executive Director of the Firefighters Burn Institute. Welcome, Joe. So some of our viewers may be familiar with the Firefighters Burn Institute from the fundraisers and the intersections. I think I've seen firefighters gathering cash in their boots. Um, could you tell us more about what the fundraising events provide? Yeah, the, that fundraiser is one of our largest fundraisers. We do it at Greenback and Sunrise. We do it in February uh, for four days. Uh, we have firefighters that are actually in a tower for that whole time. Um, and then there are satellite, uh, what we call satellite boot drives throughout the Sacramento region and the Central Valley that smaller fire departments do the same thing in their neighborhood and contribute to us. And it's a, a big portion of the proceeds that, that we get. Uh, we get no, um, you know, other than grants periodically, we have no real government funding or uh, all of our funding is through our events, through our boot drives and through payroll deductions through our firefighters. That's amazing. Yeah, I, I you never, I didn't realize that those fun little boot drive events can uh, lead to such great programs. Um, I, I can't remember a time when the Firefighter Burn Institute didn't exist, but uh, I, I'd love to hear about how it got its start. Okay, I'd love to. Uh, if you want to kick to the next first slide. So in 1972, there was an air show down at Executive Airport, and a plane was unable to take off from that and crashed into the Farrell's Ice Cream Parlor uh, across the street. It was a Saturday. 23 people died that day. Over 25 people were injured. In that uh, event was a Sacramento City firefighter and his family. He lost eight members of his family in, in that crash, as well as himself. Um, again, it was feral, so birthday parties and you know things like that. So firefighters responded uh, to it, put out the fire, uh, rescued the people that they could. But one firefighter said that we could do more because at that time we had no burn care in Sacramento. They were flown out to Houston, uh, to the Bay Area. Um, we had no extensive uh, burn care in Sacramento. Um, and that's kind of, so let me step back a little bit. One mm -hmm. of the things I do, I do these presentations for firefighters and firefighters have a rule that if we can remember three things. And so the three things I want you guys to take away from this is, um, the bad things happen. Uh, as when I talk to firefighters, I tell them, any one of you is uh, one bad day away from rolling up to an incident like this. Yeah. The second factor is that uh, one person can make a difference, and that's Cliff Haskell, and I'm going to talk about him a little bit. Um, and then the third thing is we don't do it alone. It takes a community to really make uh, some change. So Cliff Caskell was a uh, captain with the uh, Sacramento Fire Department. He was actually on duty that day, but not at that incident. And afterwards, when he realized that we had all these burn survivors uh, that didn't have care locally, he made it his mission to establish burn care in Sacramento. Uh, this happened in 19, incident happened in 1972. By 1973, our organization was built um with the uh under the direction of our local 522 our union and um then within a year after that we had a burn unit in uh in sacramento uh, and now the burn unit is in uh in partnership with shriners and uc davis i believe well, that's, yeah, that's kind of the beauty uh, of that. So in 1973, um, we got, got a burn unit um, in the Sacramento at UC Davis. And again, that took a lot of work, working with the Board of Supervisor, uh, Board of Regents at UC Davis. Um, burn care is expensive, and a lot of burn patients don't have good financial resources. About 25 years later, Shriners was in San Francisco. 
and they had their children's hospital in San Francisco, but didn't have a burn uh, care in uh, on the West Coast. Houston was their closest Shriners burn care. Wow. So they were looking to relocate, and they came to Sacramento specifically because of UC Davis, um, because of the state-of-the-art burn the unit they have. That burn unit is called the Firefighters Burn Institute Regional Burn Center at UC mm -hmm. Davis because of the millions of dollars we've provided over the last um, 50 years. And so they came to Sacramento. And one of the unique things that, that we have in Sacramento is the burn surgeons work both sides. So they work two different hospital systems, two different hospitals, um, and work on pediatrics in China mm -hmm. and the adults in UC Davis. So tell us more about the goals of uh, what the Firefighters Burn Institute does now. So I think initially Cliff's goal was one to get a burn unit. Um, and I, I think he's he just amplifies what a firefighter to me does and uh, continues to look at the next. What, what's the next thing we need? So we got a burn unit and then we realized the aftercare was so huge with these burn patients. Um, this is uh, Dwight right here. Uh, he's been a burn survivor. He's in his 70s. He was burned when he was in his 20s. Actually never came to UC Davis. He was treated down in Southern California. It was a um, Baja 500 uh, race. And um, he is just one of the many people that, um, have, have, that, that we get to help, uh, that we get to help support by having programs to get the adults to, to get together. We have kids programs. Um, and I'll get into some of those. If we want to go to the uh, next slide, I'll show you some of uh, the things that we do. So our Firefighters Kids Camp, we now do in Livermore. This is our 30th year uh, of this wow. camp. This, we usually have about uh, 50 kids. We're at about that mark uh, this year. It's a week-long camp uh, mm -hmm. for 7 to 17-year-olds. And what we do is we 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 treat them like family because in the fire service when we say you're part of our fire family we mean that um and so we start with activities in camp uh to build their confidence their self-esteem uh get comfortable in in the scars that, that they have yeah. um and then we take them out on an outing um and we've been everything to a giants game to roosevelt's yacht underneath the golden gate bridge to Alcatraz, to a fireboat. Um, that's we immerse them in the community with with the strength of their peers. Um, and again, this year will be our 30th year uh, of doing that camp. That's amazing. And so, I mean, obviously there are physical scars, but I would imagine you know your mental health when you're a young person and you have these physical scars. And being young is already hard enough. And then when you look different from your peers. Um, I'm sure that leaves its own scar that these sort of social programs can help out with. One, one of the things we do at these programs, I would say at this camp right now, 10 of my staff are burn survivors. Uh, some that were adult burn survivors that just came as a counselor, uh, but a good handful of them that were our kids, that once they turned 18, we asked them to come back to be a counselor in training. Um, and again, that burn survivor can speak to that younger burn survivor in a way that I can. Um, you know, I've been there, done that from the burn survivors. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and saying, you know, I, I know what it was like to be in school and, but you know what, here I am now and I'm a firefighter or a nurse or, you know, what, whatever they are. And, um, and also with the, um, the physical, um, Body acceptance, uh, to have that female burn survivor uh, talk to the, that young girl and say, yeah, this, it, it's hard, but this, this doesn't define you, um, is, is, is pretty powerful. Absolutely. Our, uh, ne our next slide is, and I talked about that one a little bit. I'm sure. very proud of this one. So this is Little Heroes Family Burn Camp. This is a camp that we started uh, probably about 15 years ago. At the time, there was no camp like it in the nation that we knew of. Wow. Uh, currently, there are other foundations that have taken this concept and just run with it. Um, the concept is to bring in burn survivors from one to six years old and bring in their entire families. And then we break them up in, into groups 
where the burn survivors are in one group learning things, how to respond when people uh, ask, you know, inappropriate or tough questions mm -hmm. um, and give them the, the, the strength of character to be able to respond to that and then be able then to move, move on with the conversation. We take the siblings and we have a program for them because what we recognized was that when there's a burn, it's a family trauma and Absolutely. those siblings um, are suffering as well. They're mm -hmm. going either from feeling like everything's about the burn survivor and, you know, feeling lost in the shuffle to um, being an older sibling, uh, feeling like they need to defend their, their sibling, the burn survivor. Um, and so that's a strong part of our program. And then the last part is with parents. And we bring in a clinical psychologist and uh, counselors, and we bring these families, and usually there's about 12 families. It can be grandparents, whoever the guardians are, or the, the adult family of that, and mm -hmm. allow them to have a discussion together uh, about the guilt that they're going through. Um, you know, I mean, simple things like a pot of uh, boiling water, and that parent mm -hmm. is going, gosh, I coulda, shoulda, and, and helping them get through that. Um, we've had some powerful moments um, in, in that group. There was one year that everybody came out with tears, every man, woman uh, that was in there. And I don't know what was said because I don't go into that room, but I, I, what I know is this was her second year of coming to camp and the first time she ever told anybody what the story was of what happened. And oh, she felt comfortable in those and these these peers then stay connected after that they reach out to each other for you know guidance and um they become their own family beyond that which is huge because you know like you said these peer counselors who've been through it are uniquely qualified to understand what they've been through yeah. and joe we got a question from the, one of the guests uh asking are all of the youth or the kids in uh, who are burn survivors do, are they all from shriners uh, good question I no and we do not geographically restrict ourselves in any way no, no. um with shriners we get a lot of kids that come up from mexico so they are at shriners but then they go home to mexico and or beyond and we we work with them to try to get them up here to camp we have adults that come in uh, from out of state that have heard about our adult programs mm -hmm. and uh, have participated, people on the East Coast. Um, so we really do not, although we focus because that's, you know, we have two amazing burn units here uh, that we make sure we try to capture anybody from that's gone into UC Davis or Shriners. Um, but again, we get contacts from the, uh, all over the state and beyond. Wow, that's amazing. So this next one we did, we started this just before COVID and we're, we're still in the midst of getting it back together. Mm -hmm. um, we call it Team Bright. It's mirrored off a uh, thing in Boston called Team Brave, um, which is firefighters connecting with kids that are, are in Shriners currently. Uh, mm -hmm. So all of those kids have not gone home yet. And this outing is one of the first outings they've had since they went into Shriners. Um, and what we try to do is get different crews from different stations. On the lower right is our Sacramento Fire hockey team, which are hockey players from departments all over uh, Sacramento area. And we took ice skating. Uh, the other one is a group from Elk Grove where uh, the consumers firefighters said, hey, let's get a couple of our crews together. And we went out bowling. Um, so we plan to do golf outings uh, and just every month have an outing where they can connect with some firefighters um, and, and have an opportunity to get out of the hospital for just a day. I love that BRIGHT stands for Burn Recovery and Groups Healing Together. That is yep. so clever. I love that. And uh, so tell us more about some of the scholarships. I heard that you raise funds for scholarships as well. We do. So basic primarily for our young adults, um, and we're trying to expand the programs that we do. We've uh, started a young adult summit for kids uh, 18 to about 21 in that, in that age range. We take them out or we, we've done the last two up in Tahoe. Um, make, make sure that they're, that they're doing okay. Um, what we've learned is once those kids hit 18, 
And that's why we bring them back as counselors. That if they fall off our radar, then sometimes they head down roads that aren't going to be healthy for them. Um, and the scholarship program is one of that. And we don't uh, we don't limit it to any amount of people, but any of the any of our graduates from our camp and you, uh, 17 is your oldest age in, in camp. We offer them uh, first a thousand dollar scholarship, and then if they fulfill that, a second thousand dollar scholarship for whatever community college, university, trade school. Um, as long as it's some route of them pursuing their education to to get a better uh, career and you know have financial stability. So that's what we do with our um, our scholarships, and then our adult programs. We uh, the Burnett is a good example. We used to have those but pre COVID. We used to have them once a month in person and it'd be kind of hit and miss with COVID. We went virtual and now we have them every week and with one a month that's in person. Nice. But the turnout that we get on on Zoom or uh, on remotely has been huge. And we get, again, people from all out, outside the state, outside the area that said, I, you know, there's no way I could get down there. But they connect with each other, talk about whatever their issues are, uh, intimacy issues, uh, burn care issues. Um, and then, then we started just uh, a little while ago doing a care provider one so that the spouses or the parents can have one where the burn survivors aren't there and they can talk about the struggles that they're going through um, and support each other in that regard. Mm -hmm. So this is our liaison response team. This was a concept that we built uh, when we had a firefighter. That firefighter is a Sacramento City firefighter, went to smell of gas uh, in a building in Sacramento. Uh, they opened up the door, gave it enough oxygen uh, that it ignited, blew him and his crew out into the front, front yard. Um, uh, he's kind of a pretty remarkable uh, individual. He actually was a combat medic in the military and post 9-11, he actually took a leave of absence from the fire service and re-enlisted. So but what we did with this program and we dealt with his wife was a huge part of it as well. When when a firefighter gets injured or burned, um, we we just invade the hospital. Um, we, we have no boundaries in that regard. We know we have a brother or sister uh, in there, we're going to go see them. And so we needed to kind of manage that and manage the, uh, the support of the spouse of the family. And so now we have a, basically a 24 seven number that every fire department in this region and for Cal fire all the way down to, uh, uh, Southern California, because they're often up here on strike teams, um, have a number that they can call if there's a burn injury to a firefighter and then we start rallying the troops and make sure one they get the care that they need make sure they're seen by somebody from a burn team because as a firefighter there are a couple of factors one we're we're, we're a different breed and we want to get back to work um as soon as possible and so if a doc tells us oh you're good to go just wrap it up and we'll go back to work um and that's not conducive to a burn injury so making sure they get the care that they need, they, the, the time off they need to heal so that that burn injury doesn't uh, get worse and then support them throughout their recoveries. And we have several firefighters that were uh, burn survivors that we use them as a support system to talk to that other firefighter, to be able to go, you know, to the firefighter whose hands are just, you know, completely bandaged up and be able to say, that's what my hands looked like a year ago, but here I am now. Um, and again, that's the power of that peer support. So what we did with this is, and we've had this for years, when I came on as executive director, I said, why can't we do this for the entire community? Now we, su we support, you know, that we are not just a firefighter base, but mm -hmm. we don't just take care of firefighters. We take care of kids, adults, civilians, it doesn't matter. But this particular program, we kind of modeled off and we call it family burn relief. And mm -hmm. what the concept is, is to get connected with the, the family when they have a loved one that's either in Shriners and UC Davis. If I can do that, then I build a relationship. Um, I'll give them a gas card so that they can commute. I'll pay for them to stay in a hotel if there's a major procedure going on. 
uh, let them know about our support groups and things like that. That way, when the burn survivor comes out, they're saying to that burn survivor, you need to check out uh, some of the programs that they have. And it's been extremely successful. That's wonderful. So tell us about this youth fire setter program. All right. So when when I was a kid and I lit something on fire, uh, I got drugged down to the firehouse and uh, they gave you this uh, scared straight uh, routine. <laughs> and and we evolved quite a bit. And in the Sacramento area, we worked in conjunction with all the departments from Metro City, Consumers, uh, throughout the Sacramento region to establish a uh, youth fire center program, an actual three-day academy. Well, over the years, the departments have kind of pulled back from them uh, because they don't have they either don't have the resources or they don't have that many of those. So we have taken this program on fully, but we work in partnership. We have over 20 different fire departments that pay us a minimal 250 a year just to be able to say, hey, anytime I have somebody, can I contact you to have you go through their program? Um, and we bring in burn survivors. One of our burn survivors that speaks uh, was three years, was a newborn and her brother at three years old uh, accidentally lit something on fire. And oh, so yeah. it's a prime example of you know what what can happen so we try to teach these kids the consequences um we hold it as account an academy we hold them up responsible for their mm -hmm. actions uh hats off eye contact um you know um and then we have probation come in talk about the legality aspects um and then a burn nurse talk about what happens when somebody gets burned um and it's hard to really track the success of it because it's like a prevention thing. You don't know if it you know, didn't happen, um, but our return rate is virtually zero in regards wow. to kids coming back to our, um, to our program. So that, that's a good sign. That's amazing. It's, it doesn't sound like it's like just scare tactics. It's obviously an education. Right, and, it, and we break them up into the different age groups so that we can talk age, you know, teenagers, you gotta approach that's it you know, yeah. group versus the little kid, mm -hmm. you know, it, um, so, um, and, and we have firefighters and, uh, burn nurses that, you know, have seen and can answer questions about what happens when somebody gets burned. Um, other programs that we do, we'll be at it to state fair for Camp Smoky. Uh, we're out there every year. We do that in conjunction with, uh, the Forest Service, mm -hmm. Cal Fire, Bureau of Indian Affairs, uh, and one other that I'm drawing a blank on. But we have a whole fire um, fire prevention thing, and each station has a different messaging, and the kids go through it, and that's staffed at the uh, uh, state fair for the duration of the state fair. Um, I talked to you about our perpetual scholarships, and again, that's um, you know for our young young adults. But we also send um, we send nurses to American Burn Association, not just nurses, physical therapists, occupational therapists. We mm -hmm. just got back from Dallas. We sent over, I think, 15 people um, that we provided. We pay for their scholarship to go out there so that they can learn the latest and greatest in, in burn care. Um, and then the lower one is the uh, Pacific World Burn uh, Conference, Congress. And that is specifically for burn survivors. And so that whole group in there is uh, all, uh, all burn survivors. Um, and we send them out. This next one is in Chicago, and it's an opportunity for them to connect with other burn survivors, hear inspirational stories, hear struggles, um, have real world conversations, again, about intimacy, body acceptance, you know, um, and it, it's, it's to every burn survivor that's ever gone to that, uh, they all say how, what a powerful uh, week it is. So those are some of the programs that, that we do for, and I will say, you mentioned on the mental health side, and it is yeah. it, that is a huge thing to get a hold of. And but we are working adamantly on it. I've got a team of psychologists, counselors, nurse practitioners, and what we're trying to do is offer resources for mental health, whether it's that child or an adult, to be able to give them at least ten visits at a counselor that we pay the lion's share for. We ask them to have, you know, pay a copay 
so that they have a little skin in the game right. and, um, and, and address because like you said, the emotional and mental health side of stuff it is huge with these uh, right. individuals. Some would even say those scars are deeper, so to speak. Absolutely, right? they are very much so. So this was is one of my favorites. And if you ever go down to the Sacramento Regional Fire Museum in West Stack, you will see this uh, in uh, on on the wall. It's it's actually a pretty huge display. But this is kind of marking the timelines of our organization. This year we celebrate 50 years uh, of this organization. Wow. Last year I celebrated. Well, I honored 50 years of the incident, and so this year. And I'm happy to be able to talk about all the all the good that's come, um, and it has all of our our timelines and certain things that that to me are kind of remarkable. Is ABA? We, I talked to you about that. We sent nurses to it. Our founder Cliff, when he wanted to go to this, um, they said, "No, we don't have firefighters go. This is for nurses and doctors and things like that." Well, he he fought that battle and he prevailed, and now we're one of the probably the larger presentations that is given at ABA. Firefighters talking to the, the, the last one I went to was a hash oil fire in Los Angeles. And it was nine of the 11 firefighters there and talking about not only their journey through the event, which as firefighters we're intrigued by, but also their care, their care at the hospital, their struggles afterwards and things like that. Um, the, uh, you'll see on there, there's a picture of the, um, um, uh, us holding a check. We provided a million dollars, uh, with a follow-up of another million dollars when UC Davis expanded their wow. unit. And that's when we, uh, took, took the name as a firefighters burn Institute regional burn center, um, and our continued support of, the, of them. Their next big thing is they have no laser. Lasers are huge for breaking up scar tissue. And right now they have to contract out to Sutter. Um, so that's probably our next big goal uh, to the tune of about $300,000. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm planning to pick up all of it, but we figure if we can get the ball rolling, get some grants, um, then again, we continue to establish UC Davis uh, its burn unit as the, one of the finest burn units uh, in the nation. Awesome. So if anyone is inspired and hoping to be a part of these amazing programs, um, let's put our money where our mouth is. Um, the website, which is simply ffburn.org. Yep. Is that right, Joe? Yep. And from and there, that has, we, we have a network for good, which is, uh, which you can do a one-time donation. You can do a, uh, a monthly donation. We have a lot of firefighters, actually a lot of retired firefighters and and civilians that'll do that. They'll throw a little bit, you know, uh, each month and it's automatic. You put it on your credit card and um, yeah, um, it's handled. Um, to, to give you an example, like our kids camp, um, our transportation costs can get pretty pricey. We're, this year we're taking the kids to Santa Cruz. So we got a charter of uh, two buses from um, San Francisco or to, from Livermore into Santa Cruz. Um, and so a, a rough figure is just in transportation costs alone, $100 um, will, will pretty much covers um, a kid's transportation. And we bring them in. We, uh, we utilize Angel Flight, which is mm -hmm. pilots that you know, fly uh, people uh, for free. Um, we have people that come in on Southwest, we pick up those flights, we make sure there's no cost to the, uh, the family for this week long uh, event that we have. Okay. You heard it here. A hundred dollars can help them with their transportation for some of these kids programs. Uh, and any donation you make to the firefighter burn Institute, hopefully in the next, you know, few months will help lead to their advanced technology, right? Hopefully getting that laser. Um, and if you're tuning in from other locations outside of the Sacramento area, you can also go to ameriburn.org to find your local uh, burn Institute in your region um, and support them as well. So um, if you like what you hear here, I don't know what they do in the other organizations, but you can definitely check it out through Ameriburn and you can learn uh, what your local fire institute is doing. 
Joe, I think that is everything. Is there anything else that you wanted to share that we didn't get to? Um, no, just mainly I, uh, that uh, I've been in this position now. I, I volunteered for the uh, in this organization throughout my fire service career. Uh, I retired from Metro Fire uh, several years ago. Um, I am so impressed what we have been able to accomplish. And when I say we, I mean the Sacramento region as a whole, from firefighters to civilians. And um, it's remarkable what we have accomplished collectively as a community in 50 years. And I'm just trying to keep that ball moving forward. So I like what you said earlier, we cannot do it alone. And that's true for um, supporting our fire or our burn survivors, whether it's through the programs with um, the Firefighter Burn Institute, or whether it's registering to become an organ, eye, and tissue donor yourself. So we'll learn more about that coming up. But just to remind you, when you register as an organ, eye, and tissue donor, one donor can save up to eight lives and restore the health of 75 others. And sometimes these skin grafts um, are not only skin uh, or health restoring, sometimes it is uh, alleviating uh septic sort of infections that could lead to death. So um, we say heal, but you have no idea whose life you could save through uh, when you register. So we'll talk about that in our next segment. But for now, thank you so much, Joe, for your time. We've gotten some feedback already from viewers that really appreciated the information. I don't think they realized the detail of, of all the work that you do. So thank you so much. Appreciate the time. Thank you all. So up ahead, we'll talk more about our tissue donation process. But in the meantime, I want to share the story of uh, one of our donor families. We were married 46 years and we had a great life. The ending was coming, but we couldn't begrudge what we had had by any means. When I told Joe's nurse that we knew death was imminent, I said, he's an organ donor. He called Tennessee Donor Services immediately. Then when we found out organs weren't viable, tissue was. The entire donation process from the start to the finish is so respectful and dignified. And Joe would be very pleased to know that that was handled that way and that I was treated that way. Your organs have served you. Your body has served you. Your body can't use them anymore. Let somebody else use them and go on. I'm pleased to introduce my colleague, Chris Donhost. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, Carla. It's glad, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, we're glad to have you. Thank well, you. Um, I know that we at Sierra Donor Services are so proud to say that we've, um, as of today, 336 tissue donors have saved and healed people in our region. Among these tissue donors, some of them are skin donors. Um, Chris, can you tell us a little bit more about um, skin donation? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, tissue donation as a whole, it's, it's a complex postmortem surgical recovery of tissue for the purpose of transplantation. And, you know, there are a multitude of tissues that can be recovered from a single donor. In fact, one tissue donor can help as many as 75 recipients. Sometimes tissues and organs are recovered for research and education, but I think for the point of um, today's webinar that we're going to focus uh, solely on donation as it relates to transplantation. Mm -hmm. So these donated tissues provide a viable alternative to an autograft or animal tissue grafts or even synthetic materials. And having several choices available for surgeons really produces the best results, the best outcomes for the patients and their needs. So today, as we are covering the topic of skin donation, uh, we'll be addressing the two different types of skin recovery 
and um, how skin is used to help those that are in need. So generally speaking, there are two classifications of skin recovery. First being split thickness skin. And the second is full thickness. So split thickness skin graft is widely known for its application as a temporary biological wound dressing. And that's used for the burn patient. There is no doubt that this type of graft is a life-saving uh, application. It, it shields the wound from the sources of infection. And simultaneously, it allows the patient's own skin to regenerate. So this type of graft um, is subject to and will eventually cause rejection or the patient will go into, will reject this type of a graft. So when the burn patient receives an allograft dressing, um, they will, they typically have about 10 days where that dressing can be on there before it um, rejection begins. So therefore these types of dressings periodically need to be changed. And my understanding is um, that that's usually done around day seven um, when from the time that that dressing has been placed onto the, the patient. The, um, uh, but over a period of time, then the patient's own skin is able to, um, to heal and they eventually will no longer need those dressings um, as a part of their recovery uh, from, from the burn or that injury that occurred. Okay. The recovery of the donated skin, it's, it is a surgical procedure and therefore, you know, it requires the same type of preparation that any other type of, you know, surgical procedure would have. It includes, you know, uh, uh, sterile draping and use of, of surgical instrumentation for aseptic um, uh, recovery of the split thickness or the burn skin from the donor. The second classification of a skin donor is the full thickness skin donor, um, also known as a dermal skin donor. So historically, you know, um, as we talked about before, skin was really only used in uh, for burn patients as a wound dressing. But today, there are more skin transplants occurring from non-burn patients than, uh, than there are from the burn, for the burn patient. And so unlike the, the, uh, uh, the previous classification that only took that topical layer of skin or the, the split thickness, the uh, full thickness skin procurement uh, recovers all layers of the skin, and which is why they refer to that as the, the dermal skin donor. And uh, there are many uses of dermal skin in transplantation. And uh, the, uh, the recipient will not have to take anti-rejection medication. I find this incredibly fascinating. Um, uh, because with organs, you definitely have to take uh, right. anti-rejection medicine right. your entire life. Well, and, and, and even with the, you know, as I mentioned with the, um, the biological dressing of using split thickness skin to help the burn patient, they also will go into rejection um, mm -hmm. eventually. It, like I say, it takes, it's usually about day 10 when that happens. So, um, but the, the dermal skin recipient doesn't have to take anti-rejection medication. Uh, and that's because of how the, the skin graft is processed post-recovery prior to the transplant. That's amazing. So essentially, uh, the skin is stripped of all cell cellular material through mm -hmm. a, they call it a, de, uh, well, it's a decellularization process. And mm -hmm. so this, the cells and the hair follicles and the blood vessels, um, it, uh, it's all removed. Wow. And what remains is an acellular dermal matrix. So I, I kind of like examples. It helps me to, mm -hmm. you know, kind of, wrap my head around all these, these terms. And, and so I guess you could say it's almost akin to a complete stripping of a house. Um, okay. And so if, if you remove the roof and the sheetrock and the wiring and the plumbing, all that's left is the frame, the wood studs. Mm -hmm. And, and so that's essentially what you have or what the acellular 
dermal matrix matrix is. And so then that matrix can then be prepared into several different graphs. So uh, that single graph from the donor can remain in its in its uh, largest state is how it was recovered. And that can be incredibly helpful for a patient who needs an abdominal wound repair. Mm. Um, uh, you know, maybe somebody who was in a severe car accident uh, mm. but that has a large gaping wound that needs to be closed. That would be a real benefit to somebody who, um, you know, needs to have that, that wound closed. Um, trauma can require unique treatment options, such as um, there was a child whose foot was accidentally run over by the family car and was oh. degloved. And in this case, initially, the physicians who were treating this child were considering that the only way to prevent infection, which if the foot became infected, would cause death to this child. Wow. Um, the only way they thought, you know, the only way to prevent infection would be amputation. Uh, but instead, there was a surgeon who said, hey, let, let's, um, let's try a dermal skin graft mm -hmm. to, to cover the foot. And that transplant surgery, it was a success and wow. amputation was avoided. Wow. Um, and that child was able to, to go on and, you know, live a normal life and play sports and do all the things that, you know, that kids do because of that full thickness skin transplant that they received. So once transplanted, that acellular matrix, mm -hmm. it's repopulated with the recipient's own DNA. So the graft is revascularized, recellularized, and basically it becomes a part of the recipient. So, so revascular meaning veins and arteries, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, uh, in, in fact, <laughs> the recipient will also repig repigment the graft to his or her own ethnicity. Oh, interesting. So mm -hmm. if you get tissues from a person of a different ethnicity or race than you, it'll eventually just match your skin yes. tone? Yes, that's true. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. Mm -hmm. I was visually imagining if it was a different color, you'd have like a patch yeah. of a different sort of color, right. but that's so interesting. And I think, you know, in, in initially uh, post-transplant, that is true mm -hmm. uh, because they're, uh, once once that skin graft has been decellularized, it's it's completely white. It's stark mm -hmm. white. But then eventually, um, over a period of time, it it does blend in. So that's such uh, a testament to that we are all really made of the same stuff, right? Yes, we can all help each other out. Indeed, indeed. You know, in a, a partial list, I guess, of other uses of that dermal skin include okay. post mastectomy repair uh, for breast reconstruction, bladder slings. Uh, periodontal procedures, um, contracture release, you know, skin can also be used for um, pelvic floor repair, um, hernia repairs, toweling ulcers. There's just uh, wow. all kinds of, of uses for skin donors and, um, and in transplant. Who is eligible to be a skin donor? Is there an age limit? Well, you know, what we like to, what we like to educate on that um, is that there are always parameters that seem to be kind of fluid, if you will, um, and things are changing all the time. And so our recommendation is that if you want to be a donor, that you go ahead and sign up on the registry. And then at the time of need, right. allow the medical professionals to evaluate the situation and be able to receive whatever um, donated gifts are viable at that time. So always check yes That's right. uh, to organ donate, organ, eye, and tissue donation. You Absolutely. never know who you'll help um, or heal. Um, you could possibly even save a life. That's right. When it comes to skin donation, in particular, there's a case that comes to my mind that really helps to illustrate the two types of skin donation that occurs. Mm -hmm. First being the split thickness skin for the burn right. patient and second being the full thickness skin right. uh, for those recipients needing that. And so the example that we have is a, is a young boy who accidentally pulled a pot of boiling water onto himself oh. and the subsequent burn uh, 
to his, his neck area um, would have taken his life. But the medical professionals, um, the doctors and the nurses were able to use burn skin as a biological dressing mm -hmm. to cover his wound and help him heal. Once his life was saved from that, that, that burn, mm -hmm. then he had considerable scar tissue that remained um, that, that very uh, thick leathery um, residual tissue or that, that scar that occurred where he was burned by that water. He was, this boy was not able to close his mouth. And, um, and so the surgeons went back in after he healed and they excised the, um, that leather they removed. Burn skin area, yeah, yeah. right? And they were then able to transplant in the full thickness skin graft. Mm -hmm. And that skin graft then did heal mm -hmm. uh, and, and it repopulated, you know, with, with his DNA, with, um, with his pigmentation and, um, and he's now able to close his mouth wow. and he is pain-free from that constriction yeah. that occurred as a result of the, uh, the burn. So when we say, you know, uh, tissue is not necessarily life saving, but the quality of his life obviously has improved and that's, you know, the mm -hmm. immense different gifts that, uh, don't one donor can bring to so many. Right. Indeed. And, and, and actually I think that when it comes to burn skin, that's kind of the exception to the rule because, um, you know, if, if there isn't a dressing or a way to be able to help prevent the infection that, it, that can occur um, following a, a severe burn, then the patient will become septic and, and possibly potentially die. Wow. So, mm -hmm. so that, that dressing that uh, burn skin is able to provide for the patient to be able to, to heal without getting an additional infection, that, that is a life-saving procedure for sure. Chris, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you for sharing all of the insight about uh, skin and tissue donation. Well, Kyla, it's been my honor and privilege to be here with you today and uh, help to provide accurate information for those who are trying to decide whether or not donation is right for them. If people have any follow-up questions, you can email us at sds.externalaffairs at dcids.org, and we are happy to answer any of your questions. Just as a reminder, if you haven't already done so, visit sierradonor.org for more information about organ donation if you have any questions. And also, if you're ready to become a registered organ, eye, and tissue donor, visit bethegifttoday.com. Again, thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you.